Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Nine Hole Podcast. This is Ian Miller. I have a very special guest with me here today. Um, Monty Lee, associate head coach, recruiting coordinator, South Carolina. Monty, what is going on, man? Oh, not much. Just finished up um, a day of practice. Had a great day of practice here at Founders Park. Um, we're just over halfway through the fall uh, segment of team practice, and uh, it's been a great fall for us so far. We've had great weather. Uh, got a tremendous group of young men that are working very, very hard uh, every single day on on the player development side of just trying to get a little bit better every single day and uh, competing at a high level and trying to you know, earn the opportunity to get on the field in the spring. So the fun is a lot, a lot of fun. I mean, the fall is a lot of fun for me as a coach, just because it's, it's all development driven. It's all about trying to, uh, you know, make each and every one of our players a little bit better uh, to instill all the things that we believe in as a team. Um, and uh, it's just a ton of fun. So uh, I, I love, love the fall and uh, just really happy where we're at right now as a program. I love that. So you you are in the fall, right? Season's a couple months out, man. What does a practice day look like for you guys um, being in the offseason, being in the fall? Um, you know, are you guys ramping up? You working out in the morning? Do you guys do team workouts and stuff like that right now? Yeah, it's a great question. So the way that the way that we the way that we train our guys, um, we, we try to give them an option of training in the weight room before practice or after practice. So it's really kind of based on their pra- on, on their class schedule. So if they get out early enough, they have a block of time before we stretch. We stretch every day at two o'clock. So they have a time where they can go into the weight room before we go out on the field. And if they can't due to their class schedule, they have an option to be able to lift after. Um, a lot of our guys choose to lift before practice if they can, just because of their busy schedules. A lot of them have study hall tutoring, things of that nature um, after practice. So a lot of times the guys will choose to train before. Um, what we typically do, like a typical day for us, and I'm obviously working with the position players, is we'll do a block of time uh, in the cages uh, with our right-handed hitters, and then we'll do a block mm. of time in our cages with our left-handed hitters, and uh, Joey Holcomb and I work with our hitters here. We create environments every single day for our guys uh, to work on in the cages. So our our cage work is very, very environment driven. I'd be more than happy to go into that, just some of the different things that we do uh, yeah. cage related wise. Uh, but it's very, very challenging. Like our, our, our environments um, are very, very challenging uh, to the player. Um, and, uh, we do them every single day. Uh, we stretch at two o'clock and our practices are pretty short and quick. Like we, we focus on the individual defensive side of things. A lot of times at the beginning of practice. So, um, you know, usually after our stretch and throw time, uh, we'll go into individual defense. And then if we are going to do a team defensive fundamental for that day, uh, we'll typically go into that and then we'll hit. And when we hit, you know, what we try to do when we get into the offensive block of time, uh, we we have a group run the bases, we have a group hitting, we have a group nice. in the cage and a group on defense. So it's kind of a four station deal uh, where, you know, our guys are getting a ton of swings in. We're getting live off the bat reads on the bases and on defense. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, that's kind of a typical day. You know, we're, we're usually done around four o'clock. Uh, we try to keep our practices again, if we can, to two hours, if at all possible. But, you know, we hit in the cages every single day uh, before they come out. Um, and uh, we're going to try to we're going to try to hit all facets of the game as much as we possibly can. We're going to make sure we, you know, work on our defense, work on our team defensive fundamentals. We're going to work on the short game. We try to incorporate base stealing uh, mm. weekly as well. Um, situational hitting. Um, again, we want to be a, a very well-rounded offensive and defensive club uh, come springtime because we're playing in the best conference in the country. So, you know, as right. as one of my favorite sayings, you don't want to bring a knife to a gunfight. So you better be <laughs> ready to go uh, in the spring. That. So I love that, man. That makes a ton of sense. So you said a couple things that, that I kind of want to dive into a little bit deeper, right? So you said uh, you guys, uh, you you give your – student athletes the the opportunity to work out before or after depending on their their class schedule um hitting in the cage you you said you guys do that every day 
Okay. Um, that's, that's rain or shine. That's, that's, that's a pre workout to the practice, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we do. I mean, because we, we just feel like, again, like if you want, if you're, if you're going to be a good offensive club, like you got to hit and you got to spend a lot of time on it and you have to develop those habits early on, uh, in their time, uh, in the program, uh, just so they get acclimated again to how challenging the pitching that they're going to face, not only in the fall, but in the spring. So, you know, we want to make sure that the guys understand uh, very early in the process, like we're not going to just stick our toes in the pool to see how cold, you know, the water is. Like we're going to push you off into the water and you got to figure out how to swim pretty dang quick. So, um, so we, we try and we try to find that sweet spot early on to where it's challenging but there's also room for growth. Like they're going to fail some, but there's some room for some success there too. So like the velocity and the level of spin that we're facing early on is, again, it's it's the right shape of the breaking ball. It's the right distance for the fastball. But, you know, it may be more of a mid-80s fastball early. And then once they learn that, they figure out how to time that up and they're squaring that up. Like we have kind of a ratio of success that we look at. Like we like we like guys to have a 40 to 50% success rate. If we feel like we're hitting that number uh, with success in the cages, we know we're at, we're kind of at the right level of challenge. If they're having more success than that, it's too easy. And if they're not having in that 40, 50% range of success, then it's probably too hard. Um, you know, right now we're in the middle, of, oh, I guess towards the end of October, like our guys daily – uh, are hitting effective velocity of about a 92, 93 mile an hour fastball daily on the field. And that's what we take BP off of. It's like kind of they're acclimated to it by now and they yeah. hit it pretty dang hard on a regular basis. So, uh, but we've built them up to that. It's not like we just roll out and hey, day one, here it is, 93 mile an hour fastball. You know, see what you can do. You know, we kind of start out again in that 85, 86 range, and next week it's 87, 88, and we just kind of work our way into that. Same same thing with spin. Um, so, but but we're also not doing flips and T-work and coach pitch BP and making them feel really good in the cages either. I'm, I'm not a huge fan of that. Again, you know, we, we don't want to bring a knife to a gunfight. When a guy gets out there on – you know, first day of inter squads, he's facing, they're facing real SEC arms. These guys right. are 92 to 95. They're throwing a really good slider. They got a change up. Like you better be ready to roll against elite, elite, you know, competition. So we try to train them that way. I love that, man. I, that's, that's amazing. So 40 to 50% success mm -hmm. rate is what you are. That's, that's what you guys are aiming for in practice. That's how difficult you know, your cage work is. That's how difficult your pre-work is before you guys are even getting out onto the field. Yeah, and we want them to understand that we want them to understand that if they're not failing in the cage environment and out on the field some, they're not going to get better. Like you're you're not going to get you're not going to get better. For instance, like if let's say we take 20 swings, four rounds of five off the fastball machine on the field and you square up, you know, 14 out of 20 of those pitches and we run track man like we collect data we tag we tag all of our swings um you know if you're 14 out of 20 on squaring the ball up well you know we need to ramp up the amount of velocity you're facing because you're having a 70 percent success rate too like high. that's too high you know but but therefore but also on the other end of that like if you're you know if you're like six out of 20 as far as balls that are you know we would consider you know a, a hard contacted ball um, you know, you're six out of 20, you're probably, it's probably too challenging for you. So, you know, then we can begin to look at what do we need to do for this player to either make it more challenging or what do we need to do to this individual to, you know, to try to help them, um, you know, in this area of the game. Like if a guy's super late on the fastball or his swing doesn't allow him to get to, you know, a high spin heater uh, or sink, you know, we work on we hit sync like we spend a decent amount of time training our guys how to hit sync. So, you know, there's a different swing to hit a sinking fastball than it is to hit a high ride, high spin fastball. So we spend time on both. Like we train our guys how to hit a sinker. We train our guys how to hit a, you know, a riding fastball. We also train on, you know, hitting a lefty and a right handed slider as well. So you know, we want to, again, have as many different weapons at our disposal come to springtime 
and solutions to what we're going to face in the springtime as possible. And we try to mimic that as much as we can uh, in our practice environment. I, I absolutely love that. I absolutely love that. So um, while we're on the hitting thing, right, talking yeah. about hitting. So um, you mentioned you and you and Joey Holcomb are working mm-hmm. with the hitters, right? Um, okay, so your, your first year back, South Carolina, you guys hit 117 home runs. Uh, and you had 380 walks with yep. 107 hit by pitches. So that is absolutely absurd. Absurd, especially being in the SEC. Um, what's the thought process? So obviously you guys work your asses off literally every day. You guys are training, not training to fail, but you are training at such a high level intensity and like against challenging, you know, odds, right? You're not making it easy. Um, so you guys are training to, to be able to do stuff like this, right? Right. What was the thought process like outside of obvious, the hard work sacrifice there in the cage that people don't see, right? What's the thought process? What do you get? What are you guys teaching? What are you guys trying to implement as, you know, as, as hitters, right? What's, what's a thought process that, that you're teaching these guys to do this type of damage with while also being selective and getting on base? Yes, yeah, a great question. So we want to be really good at the two things that you cannot defend, and that is a home run and a walk. You can't defend those two things. If the ball goes over the fence, they can't catch it, and you can't defend it when a guy walks. So, well, how do you do that? Well, and, and we never talk about hitting home runs. So that's another thing, too. Like, we don't – we actually don't talk about hitting home runs. We really don't train that a whole lot. We just happen to hit a lot of home runs based on, again – Some of the things that we do in the cages and how we train our hitters uh, Uh allows our guys to maximize their power output. And I can go into that if you want to if you want me to dive into that. I'm more than happy to do that. But the first thing that you got to understand is if you want to hit the ball hard, even if you're not a power hitter, if you want to maximize how hard you hit the baseball, you've got to swing at good pitches. And so the the first thing that we talk about with our guys is. Um, you know, you can have the best swing in the world, but if you swing out of the zone, you're not going to have any success. So I'll kind of tell you a story to bring you back to why we teach what we teach now and how we teach it. Um, So I read an article. This was, this article is probably by now six years old, six, seven years old. And it was basically, I was, uh, I was the head coach at Clemson at the time. And I, I Googled most disciplined hitters in the big leagues. I just wanted to read articles on plate discipline. I've always been fascinated by plate discipline and been a big yeah. believer in it. And I uh, was just, you know, spending some time on the computer and I Googled that. Well, this article popped up and it basically talked about in the last 20 years, like since 2000 or so, uh, the hitters that made the best swing decisions in an individual season, like all the pitches they saw, how many balls did they take? How many balls did they swing at? How many strikes did uh, they take? And how many strikes did they swing at? And basically, a good decision is a strike swung at and a ball taken, and a bad decision is a strike taken and a ball swung at. Okay. So you got good decisions and bad decisions. Okay? Irregardless of count. Yeah. Okay. Regardless of count. This has nothing to do with count. It's just simply, did I, did I swing at a strike or take a strike? Did I swing at a ball or take a ball? Gotcha. And if I took a ball and swung at a strike, that's a good decision. So so I started charting that, and I did it by eye, okay? So, like, I would literally, if the umpire called it a ball or called it a strike, I would just dot it, ball taken, strike taken, strike swung at, ball, you know, ball swung at. And I started calculating just dots every day. I would calculate your percentage of good swing decisions. And like the elite, elite big league hitter, the best 20 major league seasons in the last 20 years, all of them have been between 80 and 82 percent right. Damn. Okay? And the worst big league seasons, they also in the article had the worst 20 big league seasons. They were all in like the 60 percent range of of right decisions. Okay? Oh, wow. Okay. So our standard was very simple. We want to be at 80 percent. Like, why not shoot for the moon? Right. So we told our guys, like in the fall, like I'm going to judge you on two things, your quality at bats, and we define quality at bats, like a lot of people, and your swing decisions, okay? Like am I swinging at good pitches and am I taking balls? Well, what I found when I started doing that that was super eye-opening for me 
was that we had like 20 hitters and each of our guys got like roughly 50 at bats in a fall. So you do the math. That's a lot of, that's a lot of data. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, we could, I could count on, um, on two hands, literally how many hits we got on balls. So, you know, you do the math on a, on basically what would that be 50 times 20, what's that a thousand at bats? I mean, you start doing the math and not not 10 hits on balls for the fall. So it was pretty eye-opening to me that the number one indicator of your success as a hitter is do you swing at strikes and do you and and how how well do you know the strike zone? So what we started to do was try to really simplify it to we're gonna shrink the strike zone down at all times. I love it. And and you know, like we'd never expand the strike zone. Uh, so like coming here. You know, we talked about swing decisions and quality at bats, and we talked about shrinking the zone. We actually, like, we wanted our guys to swing less in and at bat than swing more. Like, we wanted our guys to shrink the zone, and we would, and it would be dependent upon what type of pitcher we're facing. So, we're facing a sinker guy, we would shrink the zone. Actually, like for a right-handed hitter facing a sinker guy, like middle away, because the ball had to start in that tunnel to be a sinker I could hit. If it was a high ride fastball guy, we would sit middle top of the zone. Um, you know, if it was a lefty it. sinker guy, we would sit middle in, honestly, because the amount of run, the fastball running, if you sat away, it would run off the plate. So we would start to shrink zones and hunt tunnels of pitches and eliminate pitches. Like if a guy, we would use a track man data. Another thing that was super, super eye opening for me is last year, in the SEC, off of every pitcher that we faced, only 48% of the pitches in all counts were actually thrown in the strike zone. Really? Yes. So, like, even a guy, like, you know, a good standard for a pitcher is to be at 60% strikes. But actual pitches that were in the zone, as a whole, only about 48% of the pitches That's are actually insane. in the zone. And when you get into two strike counts like 0-2-1-2, it's more like 30% of the pitches are in the zone. So if you think about expanding the zone and trying to cover more with two strikes, you're actually doing your hitters a disservice, in my humble opinion, if you don't shrink the zone with two strikes. So it was really eye-opening for me. And we had a we had some guys last year that were that had hit for power in the past, but they their chase rates were super high. So what we found was by shrinking the zone, it gave the hitter more freedom to hunt a pitch he could drive, and it was okay to take a borderline strike. I love that. Uh, it was okay. It was okay to take a borderline strike. Now, the the only things that I, I I think you never should do as a hitter, we don't check our swing and we don't deaccelerate our swing. So, like, we never check our swing because when we check our swing, we're making a late decision. That means you're not on time. Every time you check your swing and hit the ball, it's because you're late. So if you value being on time, never check your swing. And if you value driving the baseball, never deaccelerate or slow your swing down to make contact. Always take your best swing. It's better to swing and miss with your best swing than to slow your bat down and put the ball in play. Amen. So like our mentality is we hunt pitches we can drive and we always take our best swing. And I'm a big believer in trying to drive the ball to the opposite field gap. Like if we want a good connected swing, the barrel always works away from our body and not across our front side. So we want the barrel to work out away from our body. So we try to drive the ball to the right center field gap if I'm a right-handed hitter and, and obviously the left center field gap if I'm a left-handed hitter because I want a connected swing and I want to be on time to the fastball. So we cover, again, we want guys that can hit the ball to all fields, Shrink the zone, take your best swing, and the byproduct of that is you tend to walk more because you're not taking, you're not swinging at pitches that you can't drive. You do more damage. Now I will say this: we do strike out a decent amount, and the reason that we strike out a decent amount is because we get deeper into counts because we take more borderline pitches. Um, and when you're getting deeper in counts, teams that walk a lot tend to strike out a decent amount too. But there's also uh, my belief is too is like when you walk a ton what does that do to the pitch count of the pitchers it drives it up oh yeah so 
you know, guys that see five plus pitches in an at bat, you have a lineup full of those guys. It's very hard for a starting pitcher to get through your lineup twice. You get into the bullpen earlier, you score more runs. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to score runs. Um, I love so, that. and you know, we had a really good offensive club uh, because of that. And uh, those are just some of the things that, you know, kind of fundamentally we believe. We swing heavy bats. Like I'm a big believer really? in swinging. Yeah, we swing heavy bats. Uh, we hit off machines a good bit. Um, I love it. So uh, we do a lot of bat variability work. Um, again, to train guys how to rotate properly. Like we're, we're really big on understanding how to, you know, to, uh, to decel your swing uh, through your trunk, to rotate through your trunk, not spin on your feet. Uh, you know, we use the farm boards. We, we swing water balls, water bags medicine balls, heavy bats, short bats. Uh, we do, uh, you know, just a ton, a ton of, of different things. We use core velocity belts to learn how to hinge properly and load it to our hips properly. Um, it's so, incredible. you know, we, we incorporate a lot of different things in our program to develop our hitters. That's incredible, man. Um, I spent a little time in pro ball. I hitting coaches that aren't that in depth, right. Aren't that even like open to, trying new things, trying, you know, different, not, not saying technology, but, you know, heavy bats, weighted balls, stuff like that, you know, going outside the box and man, that's, that's incredible. Um, I'm sure obviously you guys have tip top technology, right? You guys are in the SEC. You got it. You know, I, I get it. Um, so obviously you guys are, are, are practicing the way that you want to play on the field, right? You guys are making it challenging. Um, obviously your hitters are advanced, Right. And you guys practice that way. Um, so in the 21 years, you've been a full time coach. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm pulling the stats out right here. All but one have been winning seasons, mm -hmm. which is insane. That's insane. That is insane, especially doing it at the level that you're at um, consistently. Um, how do you teach your kids how to play the game? Right. Oh. How do you teach your players how to play the game? You're, you're shelling out, you know, 20 out of 21 winning seasons, right? What, how are you teaching your kids how to go about playing this game? Well, I'm probably going to sound very simple um, with some of the, some of the observations and uh, explanations that I give you. But again, it's, you know, I'm, I've been doing this now for half my lifetime. I think the first thing you got to do as a coach, if I'm speaking to a coach, uh, to coaches is you've got to, you've got to develop uh, challenging environments uh, in practice that are going to make your players better. You also, you also have to make sure that your players look forward to coming to the field every day. Like you, you have to, you have to be, you got to be super positive with the guys. You have to be super patient. Um, you know, your body language as a coach matters. Like when guys are not doing something the right way, whether it's a drill or not playing well, when, when things are, are not going the way that you think they should be going, that's when you need to double down on being super calm and super positive with your players. I think that, that, that shows the players a lot about you as a person that you care about them more than, you know, uh, how they perform, um, you know, early on as a head coach, you know, I would get frustrated pretty quickly when things weren't going well and, you know, guys tend to tense up and play even worse. Uh, so, you know, I think that's, that's a big part of it is try to make sure that, Try to make sure that they have a lot of fun and that you're loose uh, and positive and encouraging, but also that the environment is very challenging. Um, I, I think it's important to be super, super honest with your players. Uh, like my guys here at, at South Carolina, I don't have them call me Coach Lee. They call me Monty. I want them to call me by my first name. Um, and the reason is, is because I hope they I hope whenever their time, you know, with with me as their hitting coach is done, that we actually have like a, a, a relationship that's yeah. more peer to peer than coach to player. Man. You know, my job, my job is to try to guide them and help them and serve them as their coach. Like, so like, I want to be able to sit down and have dinner with them and talk about life, talk about baseball, like, you know, like I did when I played, you know, just like teammate to teammate. Like I want them to be comfortable talking to me about anything. Um, you know, because it, it, it doesn't have to be, uh, you know, coach coaches here, up here, and players down here. I don't think it really needs to be that way, especially in this day and age. 
because you have to be more accountable than ever for your what you teach your players because kids today can just go on YouTube and YouTube anything, right? Yep. And they can follow anybody on hitting in on Instagram that they want. So it you know your way is not the highway in this day and age. Like they can if you're if you're talking about something in a swing today with a kid, the kid's going to go look it up uh, on Instagram or on YouTube and they can see like, do you know what you're talking about or not? So for me, I love this generation because like it forces you as a coach, like you better be accountable for what comes out of your mouth because they can, they can fact check you (laughs) pretty quick. Um, so it, it just, I think that, you know, for me, it's about having that peer to peer type relationship with guys today. Um, it allows me to be myself even more. I think it allows them to be themselves even more. Um, so that, those are some of the things that I would say just in general, I think when it comes to being successful, if your kids know you love them and you care about them more than their performance, they'll play hard for you. I love it. Um, and, and if they know that even when you lose, that you still care about them, um, and that, you know, the next day is a new day and you're over it, then they'll play better for you. When you're moping and you're dragging and you're frustrated on a three game losing streak, and you show up and you're in a bad mood, you know, that that's when that's when things start to go awry for you as a coach. So yeah. I just try to manage my frustrations the best I can. And I'm human. There's days where I get frustrated, but I really try to manage my frustrations and put them first. I think that as a coach, like you you chose a life of servitude to so serve the players. Oof. I love that right there. I love that right there, man. That makes that makes a ton of sense. So um you've you've spent obviously a, a great amount of time um, you know coaching some of the best teams, some of the best players um, in the country year after year, right? We talked about it, uh, you know, 20 winning seasons out of 21, man. So you've been around some of the top talent in college baseball. Um, What's the common theme, right? In some of the best teams, the best players that you've personally coached, you've personally been around, like what's the, what separates them from the pack? You have the top dogs at whatever school you're coaching at. Right. You have some of the best talent in the country, but what separates the men from the boys in the best talent in the country? It's a good question. I mean, ah, you know, the best. So I think as far as the teams go, the best teams that that I've coached just and and you hear this all the time, but I'll, I'll go into the reasons why. Like, I'll explain why. But the best teams that I've coached, uh, they don't beat themselves. Um, and, and that starts with pitching and defense. Like, you know, when you beat yourself in the game of baseball, what typically happens is you walk too many guys and you, and you kick too many balls. You give the offense more opportunities than they should have with runners on base to drive in runs, right? You can't score runs if you don't get on base. So, you know, if, if, if you have a group of pitchers that can throw three pitches in the strike zone, can execute pitches in the strike zone, you have a defense behind them that can make every routine play and go make a great play when needed, when you have those type of athletes on the field that can cover ground, have tremendous range, and can make plays, then you force the opposition to beat you by hitting you, and it's really hard to do that in the game of baseball. Uh, so we want to have the flip side of that on offense. We want to have a team that gets on base, that values the wall, that values the hit by pitch, that knows how to steal a base. You know, again, the free 90 battle, like we want to win the free 90 battle and we want to have guys that can drive the baseball because we know if we get on base via the free 90 and we have guys that can juice baseballs, when you throw up crooked numbers in baseball, you're going to win. You know, if you score three runs in one inning, you're going to win 88% of the time. So, I mean, just do the math. Yeah. So, you're not going to score three runs in one inning typically without at least two free 90s. Okay? So, like, you look at at like any box score you want to look at, if there's three runs in that inning, I guarantee you nine times out of ten, it included a hit by pitch, they reached by error, or they walked. So if you can get on base, if you value the strike zone, and that's what this game boils down to, the teams that value the strike zone the most, that dominate the strike zone the most on pitching and on and, and on defense together, we pound the strike zone and we make plays. We force you to swing the bat. We beat you in the strike zone. And the offenses that don't swing out of the strike zone, that dominate the strike zone, 
the teams that do that are going to win a lot of baseball games. It's really that simple. Uh, so the teams that I've had that did that were the teams that have been ultra, ultra successful. As far as the players go, um, you know, one of the things on the hitting side that I would say really stands out to me and is probably the first thing that I look for in the recruiting process, as, as crazy as this sounds, elite hitters can turn around a good fastball, man. Like if, if they can just – they can spin a heater around. Like you walk in the ballpark – Guy's on the mound, he's throwing over 90 miles an hour, and a kid steps up there and just smacks a ball in the gap. It's like that stands okay. out, right? Like you have to be able to handle velocity. You okay. have to be able to hit velocity. And the best hitters that I've ever coached could handle upper-level velocity, and they could handle upper-level velocity in all parts of the strike zone. And they had holes like anybody else. Like most big guy, most guys that are really good hitters typically have a hole in – more than a way, believe it or not. Some some guys, it's the other way, depending on body type and how their swing works. But more times than not, like guys that have the ability to hit the ball to all fields and can and can spin a fastball around and can drive a fastball uh, and have a really good plan at the plate. Like they walk up there, they know what they want to hit. They 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 know they know how to use the whole field. Like they're very very hard to pitch to. Um, Another thing too that's really important, I think, is like the best players that I've that I've that I've coached. Typically, they they're very cerebral um, and they're very even keel. Like they don't they don't typically let one game beat them up too bad. Mm. Like they don't they don't get super frustrated. Like guys that are mentally tough have low levels of frustration. Guys that are mentally weak have high levels of frustration. They get real high. They get real low when things Big are going time. well, bad. Yeah. Yeah. So like, you know, guys that that are like helmet slammers that go crazy in the dugout, those guys get frustrated quick. You know, those guys are pretty mentally weak overall. Like if you can set them off just by one bat at bat, they typically are like, you know, it's kind of like a roller coaster ride career for those guys. When they're hot, they're hot. When they're not, they're not. So most of the guys that I've coached that were real good hitters were more cerebral. Like if they struck out in a big situation, they may be a little frustrated, but they kind of let it go pretty quickly and move on. And, um, you know, th those are some of the characteristics that I've seen of like elite, elite hitters. The best hitters that I've coached to were not necessarily always the hardest workers. Really? Um, yeah, I mean, it. you know, sometimes they were. But, you know, I wouldn't say that, you know, necessarily like the guy that was an absolute cage rat, like turned himself into the best hitter on the team. I've seen guys that you know, they felt like, look, I, I'm a really good hitter and I know what I'm doing. And sometimes if I hit a ton in the cage, it actually screws me up because I start overthinking. Um, so I've seen all types when it comes to that. Uh, okay. I've seen guys that were, you know, that were crazy about hitting and hit a ton and were elite, elite hitters. I've seen guys that weren't like that, too. But probably the biggest common characteristic was just the ability to remain cerebral and even kill regardless like if they were going good or things were not going good they knew it was just that literally in the next at bat i'm gonna get you like at I some point that. because i'm an elite hitter i'm gonna get you it may not come may not come today but it's definitely gonna come if you keep throwing the ball over the plate i love that i love that man that fi that fires me up that fires me up um so you, you you talked a little bit about like you you'll you'll also look for that in a recruit right being on top being able to turn a fastball around Right. Mm -hmm. That's that's kind of how you can like, you know, pop out, stand, you know, stand out. Right. That's kind of what that that'll check a box off for you. Um, so when you are recruiting. Right. Mm -hmm. What are you looking for in let, uh, portal aside? Right. Obviously, the portal's crazy now. So like there is a plethora of other options that you can recruit from that you can, you know, get talent from. Right. Um, the best talent in the world wants to compete at the highest level with the highest competition on the, on the best teams. Right. So it's going to get even crazier for high school kids that want to come to, you know, a South Carolina and be a freshman starter, right. And make it to the college world series, man. Um, like what are you looking for specifically in a recruit in a high school recruit, right? You go to, you go to see somebody, what are things that are standing out to you? And what are things that are, you're, you're off on this guy for, for yeah. whatever reason. I think, well, I think number one, you know, the guy's got to be able to hit. Like, I mean, you, you got to have, you've got to have the hit tool, but it also depends a little bit on your position too, right? I mean, 
you know, there's certainly there's certain types of guys that, you know, you're going to look at, you know, defense over bat. Uh, if you're trying to sign a shortstop, look, you're not going to sign a shortstop, you know, based on his offense only. Like if he can't play defense at that position, he's probably a, you know, a sec- he's probably an outfielder, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, so I, I think there's, there's, and I'll explain, you know, kind of my thoughts on that, but you're going to look at the hit tool. The, the biggest thing that I look for when I go to watch uh, a baseball player is I want to see a guy that I believe has enough defensive skills and to to play multiple positions. Mm. Like I look at a guy and I say, okay, he can catch and throw the baseball at a high level. That guy could play short. That guy could play second. That guy could play third. You could stick that guy in the outfield. Like he's got defensive flexibility in and the SEC like, at an yeah. SEC competitive yes. level. Dude, oh, yeah. So that is, <sighs> yeah. You better like you need to have defensive flexibility. I like guys that have really good approaches at the plate and I feel like are good hitters. Like if I see a guy that can hit the ball to all fields and like he has a plan at the plate and then like you go watch him play defense and you're like, that guy's playing shortstop. He may not be a shortstop, but he can dang sure play second or third. Mm-hmm. I could put him in the outfield. He has that defensive flexibility. Does he have does he have defensive skills? I'll be honest with you, like the last tool that I I don't I don't worry so much about speed. Like people go crazy over speed. Look, I've seen a lot of guys that could run like gazelles that couldn't play a lick. And I've seen guy and I and I've seen guys that weren't very good runners that could really freaking play. Yeah. So like I don't like if they can run, to me, this is just me, to me, that's a bonus. That's a bonus. Like, I look for defensive flexibility, great approaches at the plate, and a good hitter. If that guy can run too, great. Gotcha. Um, but, like, you know, like, I, I never say a kid can't play shortstop because he can't run. Gotcha. You know, or like like we had a kid that played here uh, when I first came to South Carolina. He played more games than any player in the history of the program by the time he was done, Michael Campbell. Michael Campbell was a six nine seven zero runner and played center field. Wow! Uh, Jackie Bradley Jr. I signed Jackie Bradley Jr. and then really? I went to be a head coach at the College of Charleston. Jackie Bradley Jr. in high school was like a six eight six nine runner. It's incredible. That's a big league. That's a big league center fielder. He's the I mean, you know what I'm saying? So like, yeah. people can talk about you know you got to be a six five runner. You got to be a six six runner. Like, I mean, I saw two elite elite college baseball players. One was a big leaguer and one played the double A. And those guys were not like on a watch. They weren't like elite runners, but boy, they played fast on a baseball mm. field. So Yeah, baseball fast. Baseball fast. So again, like I'm looking for baseball players. Like that guy, can that guy play defense? Yes. Can he play multiple positions? Yes. Does he have a plan at the plate? Yes. Can he hit an elite fastball? Yes. You know, like those are the things that I look for, like swagger. You know, like, guy, does the guy have swagger? Does the guy walk with his head up and his chest out? Confident. Uh, yeah, is he confident? Does he play with confidence? Like, does he make others around him better? Like, how does he treat his teammates? Like, you know, is he about winning or just about himself? Um, you know, those things are those things are important too. But I ultimately, I would say those are the characteristics I look for in a player. So how about that is on another level. That is way even more in depth than I was thinking um obviously the game's changed since when i went through the recruiting process like in, in, incredible what is a disqualifier in your eyes so obviously we touched we touched a little bit on you know some of the things that you're looking for um which is extremely beneficial for the next generation of baseball players hearing it from one of the top coaches or one of the top programs so what's a disqualifier what is something that you show up to see somebody right maybe, maybe I, I hear these stories of like, you'll go, not you specifically, but a coach will go to, to scout somebody or look at somebody, see what this player is about, and somebody else catches their eye. And then, you know, yeah. that person stood out, and that scholarship's now this kid's, right? Oh, yeah. But I've done that. That's happened plenty of times. That's, ins- that's, cr- that's crazy, right? That's supposed to happen. What's something that is a disqualifier where it's like you go to see this kid, and this kid actually has an opportunity to play in front of Monty Lee? Mm-hmm. what's something that he does that'll just be – that'll turn you off? Be like, nah, I'm out on that kid. Nah. Yeah, I mean, and I wouldn't say that this is necessarily like a disqualifier for me, 
but I would say these are red flags for me. That doesn't mean that I wouldn't recruit the kid because I think that everything in this game, um, you know, you can be coached. Like you can develop it and get better in certain areas. But one of the red flags for me, and, and this is a makeup question. So, like, I look at a player and I want to try to determine, like, also, once I determine what I think his skill level is, I also want to look at, like, what kind of makeup does this guy have? And when I say makeup, like, how tough is he? Does he play to win? Like, does he have winning makeup? Um, if you don't run balls out, like if you're, if you know, I'm a little bit old school on that. Like, you like on the the bases show me the character of the player. So like when you're on the bases, that's where that's where your makeup shows up. Like, do you go first to third? Do you go on a ball in the dirt? Do you run a hard ninety down the line every time when you hit the baseball? Like. Those kind of things, like your your makeup and your character as a baseball player show up on the bases. Like you hit a fly ball and you jog the first and you're pissed about it. Like that's probably like that's going to have to be coached out of you pretty quick. That's right. Um, you know, because, again, you're making it about you. So, I mean, to me, like if you're a team or a team oriented guy, like you're going to run the bases hard because that's how you're supposed to play the game. So I'm a little old school on that. If I see a guy that don't run the bases hard – that's a red flag for me on his makeup. Um, you know, I look at like in at bats and in certain counts, like what does like if a guy chases a ton of you know pitches outside of the zone, that's a red flag for me. Like usually guys that chase a ton in high school, they're going to chase in college. Like it's very, very hard to fix that. Uh, so it's really important, I think, early on in a kid's career to understand an approach at the plate and have coaches that talk about the approaches at the plate. Like, I think we have so many guys in this day and age that are developing swings, right? Like, we got a lot of swing coaches, but how many, like, hitting coaches do we have? Like, is this going to work in a game? Like, dude, like, what is your approach and plan versus this pitcher today on the mound? Like, to me, that's where, you know, you're either teaching a guy how to hit or you're just teaching him to have a good swing. You know, we got a lot of guys. You're, you're not up there like you're not a swinger. You're a hitter. So I think like we've kind of screwed that up a little bit. Um, so I, I, I don't like I don't like uh, hearing kids like talk about the fact that they're not hitting is just because of their swing. Like it's 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 typically like what you're swinging at. <laughs> so, yeah, no kidding. You know what I mean? And like so many coaches and so many kids today are it's like it's kind of training them to believe that well, you know, I'm not hitting great because I've been working on my swing and making some adjustments with my swing. I'm like, dude, like get in there and freaking compete and just hit like, you know, get good pitches to hit and, and hit. And so for me, like guys that chase a ton, guys that are very swing mechanic oriented, uh, those are red flags for me because like the best hitters that that I've coached, like they weren't swing mechanic oriented in high school. It's like, dude, I just this is what I do. My dad, my dad told me, my it. dad threw me BP and told me to hit line drives, you know, back up the middle. And that's all I ever knew. And so that's all I ever did. So, well, that's usually really good because you're natural. Like it's a natural swing and a natural approach. And that's all you focused on growing up. Um, you know, you look at Freddie Freeman, like Freddie Freeman's dad just told him to hit everything to left field. He, he wasn't teaching him about his swing. Like he developed his swing by hitting balls to left field. Uh, so I think the more natural a, a player is, um, I like self-motivated players. Like when I talk to kids, mm. like I want to hear about, I want to ask them questions that, you know, like, are you like developing yourself as a hitter and as a baseball player? Or do you have like a strength coach, a hitting coach, a fielding coach? Like, do you need that many resources to become a really good baseball player? Or you can you kind of figure these things out on your own? I think like self-made players to me are typically better players. I love overall. That. Oh, I love that, man. I didn't even think about that. Um, yeah, right. You need you need a you need a whole bunch of kind of coaches around you at at the high school level to kind of get you where you're at. I mean, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? You know, when you come to the SEC and you struggle a little bit, right? You, you know, being able to be self-sufficient and yeah. kind of oh, getting yeah. yourself to where you're at is is probably you know key. Um, got a, got a couple more questions for you, man. So this, this, this podcast, right. This is, this is called the nine hole, right? So this is about, you know, the underdogs in baseball, right. The, the, the kids that are hitting out of the nine hole, right. I, I made a career out of the nine hole, right. What do you think about, at least in your lineup? Like what, what do you think about 
when it comes to the nine hole, right? What what characteristics in your lineup um, does a nine hole hitter have to have, right? What especially being at the level that you're at, playing the type of caliber you've played, right? With the with the level of talent that you've coached, like what is a nine hole hitter to you? What characteristics come with a nine hole hitter? And like, you know, I do you do you view the nine hole, you know, not not you know, lesser than, than any of the other spots, but like what, what's your take on the nine hole? What is a nine hole hitter to you? I'll look at the nine hole hitter and the, the nine hole hitter is the guy that when he comes up to the plate, that lineup is about to flip over to your best hitters. Right. Yeah. So, you know, when you flip that lineup over, you're going to one, two and three and four. Right. So the nine hole guy's job is to get on base for your top three to four best hitters. Got you. So, like, if you're going to score runs, you want those one, two, three, and four guys coming up as much as possible, right? Like, For sure. if you're in the lead offense, that's what's happening. If you got a nine hole guy that can get on base, that has a really good approach and gets on base, he's going to help his team score runs mm. because he's getting on base for his best hitters. Okay. He also has to be a guy that can do the little things at the bottom of the order to help you score runs. Okay. So he's got to have a good two-strike approach. Like he's got to be able to spoil pitches in two-strike counts and run the pitch count up. He's got to be able to get a bunt down. He's got to be able to hit and run. He's got to be able to move a runner. You get a runner at third base with one out, that guy's going to get the runner in. Like he's got to be a team at bat oriented guy. Like your nine hole, your best nine hole guys are incredibly selfless players that are going to put their team first when it comes to what they do at the plate. So that's what I look at, you know, as a nine hole guy, like he needs to be a guy that can that can get on base and can and can manage at bats and move runners and do all the little things that you need a player to do to win your game. It needs to be a Swiss Army knife. That's the best way that I would describe, you know, a nine hole guy. He's got to be a Swiss Army knife that can break out a lot of different things to help you win games. Man, that's the that's the best answer that I've that I've heard that I've gotten. So it's you know, not just a one trick pony, right? Not just, not just kind of, you know, he's not just a given out, right? There's a purpose mm-hmm. for the nine hole in your lineup. Um, love to hear that. So I got three questions left. Um, and these are from a couple hitting facilities kind of around where I'm at. Right. So, um, Ben, you talked about how you guys go about your practice. Um, you talked about kind of how you guys go about your work in the cage, Mm-hmm. Um, especially, you know, pre-practice, right? You guys are 40 to 50% success rate. You guys are making it challenging. You're not just, you know, blowing fluff, man, under, underhanded, right? Making guys feel good. You're, you're challenging. Um, so I got, I got this question, like how, how do you, how do you work? Right. So as, as it pertains to like the next generation of baseball players, right? You, you see, you can see anything you want on social media. You can see, you can get your information from anywhere, right? But there's mm-hmm. no substitute for hard work, right? Uh, obviously, some players are way more talented than others. So maybe their their volume or the time that they spend on certain things doesn't have to, you know, equate to somebody that that is maybe a little less skilled, right? Mm-hmm. But like, what does your players' work look like? Um, mm. Obviously, you guys are in fall right now. So, you know, you might be a little limited here and there, but like, are you, are you making the 40 to 50% success rate kind of like practice wide, or is that just in the cage? Like what, how do you guys go about your work? Oh, that's a pretty broad question. I'll tell you, I'll, 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 I'll walk you through kind of what we do. Um, so we do a, a lot of movement prep before we even swing a bat. So our guys are going to, you know, we, we have a, a water ball, we have med balls, one arm med balls, that we throw into the wall for direction. We do a lot of water ball swings to, to activate the core, to understand like how to decel, like the decel pattern and, 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 and train our guys to understand how to rotate through their trunk. Um, you know, we, we, we hit heavy bags. Uh, like we have a, a, a boxing bag in our cage. We, we hit the bag every day with the bat to like the bracing impact at contact. Like they need to understand how to generate force. So like we want to generate force and slam on the brakes into the bag. It. So, you know, we, we train our guys, you know, those things before they ever like go into the cage to hit. 
Um, we're really big on teaching our guys how to load correctly, like how to load into their rear hip correctly and not into their rear quad. So one of the two biggest things that I see with amateur hitters that it takes an un- unbelievable amount of time to fix if it's not right when they get to college is do they load into their quad and do they have a steep, pushy swing? So the swing mm. either works above their shoulders, down into the zone, or under their shoulders and through the zone. And when they load, do they load into their rear hip or do they shift their weight into their quad? Okay. Guys that are quad loaders and guys that are steep swingers, they typically have a really hard time adjusting to breaking balls and hitting anything down. They cannot hit the ball down. So like a steep swing path, you're going to be able to hit the ball up and out front, and that's it. If you're late at all, you can't catch the barrel you know, on the ball deep because you're not on plane deep enough to be able to catch the ball, mm. you know, unless it's just out front. So, like, can't hit spin, anything breaking down, you're not going to hit if you got a steep swing. The guys that are quad loaders, like, they shift their pelvis around. So, like, if you're, you got a swaying pelvis when you load and stride, you're never stable underneath yourself to be able to use the ground to swing the bat. So, like we try our best to like break those habits early on. So like when I'm looking at a guy and I'm watching him hit, I'm looking at like when he loads, like does his head shift back and forward mm. or does his head stay still when he loads? Because if his head stays still when he loads, he's loading into his hips and he's more balanced. So those are like some of the things that I look for, you know, in a hitter when I'm evaluating them is do they get into their hip or do they get into their quad? Is their belt buckle parallel to the ground when they stride or is it jacked up because they're really in their quad? If it's jacked up and they're really in their quad, they're going to have a hard time hitting at this level. I don't care what kind of strength they have, bat speed they have. It's just it's the adjustability piece is just not going to be there more than likely for them. So, mm. So when it comes to like how we train our hitters, like, a lot of what we do is like, we don't necessarily change their swing. We give them drills that will fix their issues uh, and promote good swing mechanics without them thinking about swing mechanics. Okay. Um, So we teach them how to load, but like the way that I would teach them how to road is to load would be like offset off angle BP and then like put a T behind their rear glute and have them load and touch the T with their glute uh, and then turn and hit the ball to the opposite field so they load in and they don't load back. Like, we don't want them to load back. We want them to load in. Got you. So, so we do drills that, te- that train them how to load correctly so that their swing is just more efficient. I love um, it. So little things like that, like understanding, like being in your heels versus on the balls of your feet. Like a lot of hitters will get on the balls of their feet. Now they're in their quads. But like when you deadlift or you squat, like you ain't going to be in the balls of your feet. You're going to be in your heels That's right. to use the ground. Well, why wouldn't you do the same thing when you hit? Like if you want to use the ground, like you use the ground when I deadlift, I use the ground when I squat. Why wouldn't I use the ground when I hit? So like we, we have our guys like curl their toes up in their rear foot. So like when they load now, they can't shift back. They load in. And now they're going to use the ground to rotate better when they swing the bat. Really? Just little, little things like over time that you pick up on and you learn as you do this for as long as, as you know, I've been doing it and I've listened to a lot of coaches. I try to be a lifelong learner Um, and uh, just best practices, I think, are kind of what we try to do. So try to get them to load right. If we can get them to load right, the swing for the most part will kind of take care of itself. And then it's about building the engine. You know, you have the engine, which is your trunk. You have the hands, which are the steering wheel. So like guys that have a good steering wheel, they can hit a lot of different pitches and put the ball in play, but they better have a strong core and a strong trunk to rotate the bat and have that bracing impact to drive the baseball. So we try to develop the engine. That's why we do so much heavy bat work, a lot of med ball throws, rotational work. We hit high velocity because you have to brace at impact and use your trunk. If you're very handsy, that hack attack is going to knock the bat slam out of your hands. You're not going to hit very well with it. So, you know, we, uh, you know, it's like swinging a hammer, right? Like when you swing a hammer, you're swinging the end of the hammer. You're not swinging your hand, you know, like you don't hammer a wall by, you know, by using your hand, you're swinging the end of the 
of the hammer. Well, the end of the hammer is your barrel. It's like you got to be able to release the barrel. Uh, so, you know, just sense. little things over time that, you know, that that we've learned and that we that we've adjusted year to year that we do with our guys to, again, you know, get them to maximize what they can do swing wise and production wise. That's incredible, man. All right. I got two two more here for you. So size in high schoolers. Right. So obviously you are, you know, the recruiting coordinator for one of the top teams in the country. Yeah. Um, so you might be getting on guys early. Right. I, I you know, I, I don't know what the, what the rules state, you know, how how young you can be, you know, scouting kids. I don't I don't I don't understand the rules. I mean, they're they're some rules are changing. Some rules aren't right. Um, especially like with with underclassmen. Obviously, some some kids will develop quicker than others. Um, regardless, I mean, I, I'm sure you can tell talent in an undersized kid, um, maybe an underdeveloped kid. Maybe he's young, well, you know, whatever it is. But physicality. Um, uh -huh. Are you looking at that specifically when evaluating a high school kid or an underclassman? Like, do you, do you take that stuff kind of into account? Yeah, I mean, you know, I do. Uh, I mean, look, if a guy's got a good body, I mean, it's obviously going to stand out, right? I mean, mm. if he's tall and he's got long limbs and he's athletic and he looks good in a uniform, you're certainly going to notice those things. But, I mean, I've seen, I've seen plenty of guys that – didn't necessarily look great in a uniform that could really play. Um, so like, it's not the be all end all for me as far as like their size. Um, um, so no, I mean, I mean, shoot, we got a kid on our team now that hit 383 last year at a school that he was at with over a 500 on base. He might be five, seven. Um, insane, man. So, I mean, that didn't stop me from recruiting him, you know, I love it. Um, so, so I if don't they're care. Small. Like how, yeah. how would they check your boxes? How would they like, you know, prove it to you? Like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm five, what, whatever it is, five, you know, five, six, five, seven. Um, yeah. how, how can they prove it to you that like, Hey, there's, there's still a baller. I mean, we got a kid coming in our 24 class. I can't tell you his name cause I haven't signed him yet, but we've got a kid coming in. He might be five, 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 six, but really? he, runs a, he runs a six, three, 60. He's got juice at the plate and he can absolutely ball. On That's defense. insane but I don't care that he's like, you know, like he came to our camp and he worked out and I was blown away by him. I didn't care that he was five, six, five, seven. I don't know how tall he is. I didn't care. It didn't matter. That's um, awesome. So, you know, like look, good players come in all shapes and sizes. I, I don't, I don't necessarily, if they got a good body, that's a bonus, but man, I've seen guys that were overweight that could freaking hit. I've seen guys that were, you know, that were, lanky and skinny that were really good players like I don't I don't care too much about how they look the main thing is is like what kind of engine do they have in the middle of their body like does this guy have some twitch does this guy have some is there some athleticism here is there some bat speed here can this guy hit can he play defense can he run like you know I look at his tools you know, we're not, you know, there was a great line in Moneyball when the book Moneyball came out. It said, you know, look, we're not selling jeans. We're not looking to sign models. We're trying to sign ball players." And I always kind of like that line because it's true about baseball players. Like, you know, sometimes looks can be deceiving. There's a lot of mm. good looking kids that can't play a lick. And there's a lot of guys that are average looking dudes that can really ball. So I just, I don't spend too much time looking at size and like how they look. Gotcha. Um, you know, that's just that's just my take on that. Nah, fires me up, man. You want ball players. Um, okay, last last uh last hitting facility question we got uh from around here. Okay, so the portal's crazy. Right? The portal's crazy. Hope mm -hmm. op opens up a new can of worms, right? You can you got free transfers, right? There you don't get penalized, you don't have to redshirt for that. Um are you mo leaning more like do you hit the portal more for recruiting as opposed to high school? I'm sure, obviously, now it's extremely attractive to come to South Carolina, especially if you're one of the best players in the in the country. You see what you guys have going on over there. You know, you know, you you want to win. Yeah. Um, you go there, right? So obviously, there's going to be portal players that you could probably pick from. Um, mm -hmm. That makes it even more challenging for a high school kid. There's things that I'm reading on here. It's like, you know, is, is Division One baseball an older players league, right? With, with you know, transfers and stuff, not as many incoming freshmen. Um, yeah. Man, are you, are you guys still, you know, focusing on, on high school talent? 
That's a good question. I think like anything, like things are typically never as good as they seem or as bad as they seem. Mm. And I think the same thing goes in recruiting. Like here, here's my take on the portal. So, you know, we don't have very much time in the portal yet. Right. Um, so when I came, when I came here last year, um, there were quite a few guys out of the portal that had been signed to come here and play. And those guys were really good players. They, and some of them helped us tremendously on last year's team because they were older. They played a lot of college baseball um, and they were really good. That being said, um, you know, we had two All-Americans, okay, two All-Americans last year, Ethan Petrie, Cole Messina. Uh, and our three best players statistically were Messina, Petrie, and Braylon Wimmer, our shortstop. All of those guys were homegrown players. They had all come in as freshmen and it all developed right here in the program. Uh, so, you know, to me, to say that one way is better than the other, look, I, I always would lean towards signing high school guys and developing them yourself. It's always going to be the best model. What I think the portal allows you to do is like, look, if you get nailed in the draft or you're not quite good enough in certain areas and you need to add another player in this position, go to the portal and you can go find you a guy that you can plug and play um, and, you know, he can help you immediately. Where I think the portal has hurt is junior college baseball. You know, junior college baseball used to be the plug and play where you go get a guy that's played two years of ball already. He can step in and play for you and be a little bit more ready to go for you. I think it's hurt the junior college guys uh, probably more than the high school guys. Colleges are still going to sign high school players. It's that simple. It's not like they're going to get left out. I think they think that's the case, but I don't I don't see that. Um, so for us, like we went back to the model in this 24 class of high school and JUCO guys. We've got several JUCO commitments. We've got some high school commitments. Um, you know, we don't want to be flipping our roster, you know, every summer in the portal signing, you know, eight or nine guys. If we need to go get two or three, fine. But we don't want to have to go into the vicious cycle every year of like we got to go in the portal and get eight or ten guys yeah. every summer out of the team portal every just year. to be able to survive. I don't think you can. I don't think you can do that. Now, some of the guys that we've gotten out of the portal though have been like phenomenal kids, like phenomenal. You know, so uh, I mean, even this year, like we picked up some guys that are going to help us on this year's team, and they're great. So I mean. I don't. I don't necessarily have. I think if you need to go get a guy that can play right away, you got go into the portal. But if you're going to build a program that's going to sustain itself, you got to do it with high school guys. Uh, that's just just kind of the way that I see it. I love it. I love it, Monty Lee, man. I I appreciate you. Um, I that's all I got here. Those are all the questions I had for you, man. You answered everything, and I, I appreciate you. How does What's what's the goal for this year? Um, you know how does how does uh, wh what are you guys hoping to do this year? I think I, I think I know the answer, um, but I'd, I'd love to hear it from you, man. What's the plan this year? Well, the goal is always to go to Omaha and win a national championship. I think that's every program in the country. My goal is to make our players a little bit better tomorrow. Like I just I think that I don't I don't get too wrapped up in like everybody's got the same goal, right? <laughs> Like everybody's got the same goal. My my goal is is I want to try to do everything I can to help each one of our players get a little bit better tomorrow. And if I'm doing that, those days are going to stack on top of each other, and we'll maximize what we can do as a team this year. So that's what we try to do. I, I don't I don't get so wrapped up in like Omaha is a long way away. I just want to look at today's practice, reflect on it, look at individually who we need to get better, what we need to do better as a team, and help our coaches and our players get there. Oof. Love that. Love that, man. I appreciate you, you know, spending time here uh, with us, man. Um, whoever, whoever sees this is going to benefit from it. Um, this is, this is the type of information that I wish I had when I was, you know, younger, able, able to kind of go through this process, man. Um, and, and to hear it from one of the best, um, you know, coaches in the game, man, I, I respect it. Thank you very much coach for your time, man. I, w I wish you guys the best this year. Appreciate it, Ian. Thanks for having me on, man. Yes, sir.